My father was uh, 26 years Australian Army um, and he served in Vietnam with 7 RAR. So I grew up in, a, in an environment where Army was our life. I was very keen initially to become infantry because uh, I thought I'll go and fight like my dad did. Uh, but my father sat me down when I was about 16 and said, Cheryl, girls can't be infantry. And so that broke my heart, it, it really did. So my logical thought was I'll fix the guys that fight then. So from about the age of 16, 17, I had a strong desire to serve Australia in, de in the Defence Force and to look after those guys that got injured and were ultimately paying that, um, that sacrifice. So medic was where I sort of set my sights to. I completed my uh, medics training in mid-1993 and was posted to the First Field Hospital in 1993. From there, we were introduced to obviously how a field medical hospital works and how to deploy that. And towards the end of my first year, we started hearing about uh, a little country called Rwanda in Africa. I was uh, selected to go on the first rotation to Rwanda and I was also selected to go as the advance party of that rotation. So with the first, the advance party, we had approximately 73, I think. And of that 73, there was four female and the rest were obviously infantry and um, other medical and support staff. We were very excited. We didn't know much about the country. Um, we didn't get a lot of information about the country before we went in, uh, especially the historical uh, turmoil that that country had, and indeed Africa had been in. We got some very, very, I guess, um, light briefs on the, the history of the country and where, where, what we were going into. Um, but it was generally focused on the previous UNAMI mission, which was UNAMI 1. We were told a little bit about the medical um, issues that we were, but our, primarily, uh, our primary mission going into Rwanda before we left Australia, we were told was going to be caring for the UNAMI troops. That was our only mission um, and that's what we prepared for. We obviously flew into uh, the capital, Kigali. Uh, the airport was extremely, um, destroyed by, by the conflict over the few months before we arrived. Uh, there was, uh, most of the windows were shot out or, bro or smashed. Um, there was large areas of the uh, front of the airport that had bullet marks. You could see machine gun fire um, across the facade of the uh, airport. You could, um, inside the airport, look like it had been abandoned for 10 years. We unloaded our bags and our equipment. First things off, obviously, was weapons um, and our uh, flak jackets and helmets. So we had those on initially. There were American troops on the ground and they were running, uh, obviously, the uh, airport um, uh, facilities and, and, and um, procedures. So essentially, they shepherded us into the uh, airport building and we sat there for quite some time. Um, like good soldiers, we sat around and um, twiddled our thumbs, read books, slept, <laughs> you know, played games of cards, those kind of things. And, and, and back then we didn't have iPods and, and Walkmans and, and things like that. So um, it was pretty much, you know, really just caught up some sleep um, and because it had been a long flight and uh, basically looked out the windows wondering what we were getting into. We went from the airport in the back of the trucks um, and obviously, you know, we were looking out the back watching the landscape go past us. So from the airport to our, the hospital, which is where we went to, we were going into uh, Kigali Hospital, um, it had been hit quite badly. It was quite um, shocking to see the condition of a hospital because, I mean, our, our ethos is that hospitals are off limits. You don't you know, hospitals are there, we don't touch them in war, for, you know, if you can, you don't bomb them, you don't go near them, you don't take the conflict into a hospital space, but uh, clearly they played by a different set of rules and there was um, quite confronting scenes between the airport. Um, there was bodies on the side of the road um, and they were quite at an advanced stage of decomposure, uh, de decomposition, sorry. Um, 
So to see that and recognise what they actually were, um, it was quite quiet in the back of the truck when we first start to see, see those. A lot of people were carrying their belongings on their back um, and there was a lot of movement by foot on the roadside. So people were obviously displaced um, and you know, looking to obviously move back in. A few of them waved and smiled, but most of them uh, were quite intimidated by us and wouldn't look at us and were obviously concerned at these numerous trucks going past with Australian soldiers armed, <laughs> staring back at them. I remember walking in the side doors of the hospital um, <clears throat> and we were told to find a room it was a two-storey masonry brick, brick kind of construction. <clears throat> the top floor had been destroyed by mortar fire. Um, so there was rooms on the top floor that obviously had crumbling walls in, in on patients' beds. Um, so some of the beds were still there. Um, some, of the, some of the equipment was there, but it was smashed and destroyed. There was obvious um, ransacking of the cabinets and uh, just paperwork everywhere. It was just like a cyclone had been through there um, and everything was just left everywhere. Um, <clears throat> there was uh, patients' names still up on the ward office, um, which was quite sort of, okay, this was a functioning hospital um, not that long ago. Um, so where were all the patients was our first question, <laughs> but obviously that, those that could had fled. Um, and those that didn't, obviously didn't make it. Um, so our first task obviously was to find somewhere to set up our beds. Um, and also we had to take up a position for protection of the hospital and, and ourselves in, in that facility. Day two, we got a call to all the medics get out the back. Uh, there was a mass CAS coming in. Um, and it was interesting because it was a combined mass CAS. There was a vehicle accident and as everybody would have seen those pictures of everybody fills up the bus and then if you can hang on to a part out the back, then you've got a ride. So it was a, a rollover um, and those that had survived were being caught, brought to the NGOs. The NGOs had requested our help, so we'd gone down. We set up a very rudimentary uh, triage system and um, it was also our first encounter with the local um, military as well because they brought in a couple of casualties at the same time. Um, we didn't get many, as many uh, people from the bus as we were expecting because most of them had passed between the accident site and coming to us. But those that did make it, you know, we treated and we got them into the NGO surgical facilities. In order for us to be accepted and, and obviously to win the hearts and minds for borrowing a historical term of the locals is we had to extend. Thankfully, not a lot of Unami soldiers were being injured, so therefore it allowed us to um, redirect our focus and to offer that assistance to both the NGOs, but also the, the Rwandans that had started to come back into um, Kigali to obviously restart their lives. I was selected to work in the intensive care unit in our hospital uh, under, uh, Kenneth, oh, Cap at that time, Captain Annette Outram. Um, and she handpicked a few medics to work in the ICU. And we used to get obviously the worst of the worst cases. And uh, we used to, I guess, support each other with that Australian humour, you know, the black humour, which, you know, got us through the hard times, you know, we, and we'd bring us together and we'd comfort each other and we'd look after each other. Um, but there was certainly, um, I was the only female OR and I had a, quite a few male, medics that worked with me in there, um, that we were all good friends before we got to Rwanda. And it was interesting that they would come and talk to me after hours, um, I guess, because I was the female. Um, uh, and it was just for their way of venting, getting it off your chest. If you didn't talk about it, it built, builds up. Where if we were able to sort of sit down and talk about it, it prevented it getting to that level where, you know, you just couldn't handle it anymore. So, we, um, Annette Outram encouraged that. She would do debriefs if we lost a patient. You know, we'd talk about what we had done for the patient, what we couldn't do because of where we were, you know, geographically restricted, the services we were able to provide. So it helped justify that, you know, we'd done everything we could. 
Um, and even if this person had been back in Australia, we, we could not have saved them. So that helped. Um, I don't think she realised how much, maybe she did. Um, that did certainly help me in sort of, I guess, um, processing uh, the losses that we had. We used to joke about that we had more kills than the infantry in ICU. Um, but again, that came back to our black, that black humour and, and just trying to sort of joke about what you could to keep your spirits up because the next person was coming in and you had to sort of refocus and put your effort back into that person. Um, the kids were the hardest though. They were hard. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't a mother when I was in Rwanda. I'm a mum now and I think my reaction in Rwanda would have been harder. We were tasked to obviously go up into the um, uh, camps. <clears throat> we had a couple of tasks up there where we would go out for two to three weeks at a time. We would run uh, health clinics. So we would look after those acute injuries if we could. Um, we would do immunisation programs as well to try to obviously uh, suppress the cholera and, and that that were rampant throughout the, uh, the camps. Um, uh, there was times where if we identified uh, an injury or an illness that we could assist, we would uh, organise for the transfer of those patients back into Kigali and try to offer those people. Um, but it was quite difficult because you couldn't take the whole family with you and they didn't want to be broken up. They've already been broken up by this uh, conflict. So getting them to agree to letting us take one of their members into a hospital um, and then yeah, it was quite hard, um, especially with the language barrier. We, by this stage, we had quite a few good interpreters that were working for us, and that assisted greatly in that in that space. Um, but again, we were very limited on what we could do with the the sheer numbers that were in those camps. They would know we were coming, and as we were driving into the camps, you would see this line that went for easily one to two kilometres, and they would be lining up from the day before that we'd find out um, because they knew the Australians were coming. Um, and they wanted their children. And it was always the children were at the front. Um, the, the families would always make sure the kids were treated first. Even if they had an, Ill, um, an injury, they would refuse care until their children had been taken care of, which was beautiful. We were there just over, or just under seven months uh, before the second rotation came in. Um, so, and that was a bit of mixed emotion. You didn't want to leave. You didn't feel like you'd finished your job um, so it was hard to leave especially because we had you'd established relationships with some of the families in the camps um, you know I, my mum and dad had sent me over clothes and schooling equipment like um, you know pencils and paper school books and that so I could take them up to the camps and we, we you know you'd form friendships with some of these people there was one set of kids in the camp that I remember um, they had no parents and they There was the, there was the older brother who was probably 12, um, 10 to 12. He had a little sister. She was probably about six and then the little brother and he was about two to three. And uh, he, he was amazing. He, he would source food. He was a crafty little bugger. Um, he, he would source food because obviously he had no family. Um, so he was on his own. Um, and, and his job was to look after his little brother and little sister. And he was always standing there. Whenever we went up to the camps, he'd always stand at the side of the little hut that we used as our um, regimental aid post, RAP. Um, and he would stand there and he'd look for me. And uh, he, um, he would come running up to me and he'd, Shettle, Shettle was the only way you could say my name. Um, and he would run up to me and he, he, cause he knew that I always had something for him and I'd either have a t-shirt or I'd find something that, you know, he could give to his brothers and sisters and everything went to them first. He never ate the biscuits. He would always make sure that they got a fair share. He'd go crook on them if they, you know, snatched. Um, so he was, he was the mum and dad, you know, um, he was an amazing kid. Um, so it was hard to leave them, but I made sure that he, he knew I had a friend coming on the second rotation and I gave him strict instructions that he was to meet and look after them as best he could, and which he did, and it was good, yeah. 
we got home to Sydney, we flew into Sydney Airport and it was fantastic, our, our families were there. There were members from our unit there as well and they greeted us and um, we went home from there. So we obviously went back into work. Um, it was hard because our whole unit didn't go. So there was very uh, few people on the first rotation that actually went from the field hospital. And you felt you couldn't, there was a little bit of jealousy. Um, there was also that on our behalf, it felt we couldn't talk to them because they didn't understand. So you didn't talk about it. Um, when we got back, we just got on with the job, just got back into the routine um, and you know, just did your job. Didn't talk about it much at all. I was very fortunate. I had my father, who was a Vietnam veteran, um, and he recognised. He said, have you spoken to somebody? And I said, no, I'm fine. You know, I'll get on with it. Um, and then obviously the Cabello massacre occurred. And the Cabello massacre was obviously up in the um, displaced persons camp where we had been. Uh, and it was where we'd spent a lot of time looking after the, the displaced people not a lot of information was coming back to us. So um, it was about that time where you felt you'd failed them. You felt like I should still be there. I could have protected them. Um, you felt like you could have done something and, and we should have still been there. Uh, you knew we had Australian soldiers there, but you were worried about them. That was a huge worry for us. We, you know, are our guys okay? And then obviously the question was, you know, what's happened, who was hurt, you know, and, but there was very little information coming back to us. That was, looking back now, that was a trigger for quite a few of my friends that were doing okay, but that I think that was the tipping point, you know, um, where they didn't cope well. Um, I myself, you know, didn't cope that well because we didn't have that information. You were worried about the people. You felt helpless, you felt frustrated. Um, a lot of us said, we'll go back send us back <laughs> um, but we couldn't obviously um, and that's when my dad grabbed me and said right you're going to go talk to somebody and that's when I went and spoke to somebody and said I'm having some bad dreams um, and to me I look at it a very simplistic way their brain is like a filing cabinet and my Rwanda file had fallen down the back and just put off to the side it gathered some dust and I hadn't dealt with it so we picked it up, dusted it off and dealt with it. Um, so I came to the understanding that we'd done everything we could and we did a great job with what we could, with the restrictions that we had um, and that we'd saved a lot of lives that wouldn't have been saved um, if we hadn't have been there. So, um, yeah, so in the end it was rewarding. I went to a Anzac Day not long after coming back from Rwanda and um, my dad said, come with me into Sydney, uh, obviously to meet all of his friends. I'd met them before, but I hadn't sort of reconnected them uh, with them since I joined the army and obviously gone to Rwanda. Um, I was a little bit shy um, about going. Uh, to me, they'd all been to Vietnam um, and I'd grown up story with stories of Vietnam and you know, um, so I was a little bit embarrassed and I didn't, I didn't take my medals or I didn't have my medals on when I first met with them. And I remember one of dad's uh, commanders from Vietnam come over and shook my hand and he said, have you got your medals? And I said, oh yeah, you know, in my pocket. And he just went, why aren't you wearing them? And I, I said, oh, you know, I'm a bit embarrassed. You know, I'm not, I didn't go to war. And he, he went crook on me. Um, and he basically said, you put them on and you wear them. He said, you earned them, you, you served your country and you did your job, so you wear them with pride. And since then I've never had an issue with putting them on and, and being proud to have them um, to, to wear on Anzac Day. And um, yeah, I, it was quite an honour to march with Dad and his friends. Um, and it's been good having Dad because obviously he's got that understanding. So I've been able to talk to with him but also the, the aspect I did, wasn't expecting was dad opened up to me on his time in Vietnam. We've been back to Vietnam since with dad 
Um, I went with him and went to some of the places that he wanted to go to in particular. And he was able to sort of uh, talk with me about what had occurred there and talk through it, which was the first time he'd ever done that. Um, but he didn't do that with the rest of the family. So um, I think it, veterans have that ability to connect and share those stories because there's that understanding that we get it. We, we know, you know, it's not always easy and it's not always pretty, um, but there's good times that go with the bad. And that's what you've got to remember.